So many home fragrance scents smell unnatural, super sweet, chemically, or maybe even like a part of the mall you can't wait to escape. And after learning that the candle industry contributes to an insurmountable amount of non-recyclable waste, carbon emissions, and toxicity in our air, I am so happy that Notes Candles exists. Notes Candles is on a mission to help eliminate single-use candle vessels and give home fragrance lovers a more earth-friendly option without giving up high-quality fragrance that actually seems amazing. I have been loving burning the Santal and Atlas Cedar scent. It's woodsy, calming, and smells so good. I can't get enough. I love it. And they have other amazing one-of-a-kind fragrances like oat milk and balsam berry, vanilla and pepperwood, and pistachio and rose water. Every single one of them is exceptional. Be a responsible consumer while not giving up high-quality home fragrance by making the switch to Notes. You can build your custom starter kit right now at notecandles.com slash best of you. Right now, Notes is giving listeners 15% off and free shipping when you buy a Notes starter kit using code best of you. Just use code best of you when placing your order. That's code best of you at notescandle.com slash best of you. Most of us could use more energy in our day, but we have to find ways to replenish our bodies in healthy ways. It turns out two main factors in low energy are chronic stress and a lack of nutrition. Organifi creates delicious superfood blends that address both of these problems. In the morning, I love Organifi green juice with essential superfoods and a clinical dose of ashwagandha. It helps reduce stress and support healthy cortisol levels. And in the afternoon, I reach for Organifi red juice. It's a great tasting superfood punch that increases energy without the caffeine and only two grams of sugar. Each Organifi blend is easy to use by simply mixing it with water or your favorite beverage while on the go. You can experience Organifi's high-quality superfoods without breaking the bank. Head over to www.organifi.com slash best of you and use code best of you for 20% off your entire order. That's Organifi, O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com slash best of you and use code best of you for 20% off. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Allison, and I'm so glad you're here to discover what brings out the best of you. This podcast is all about breaking free from painful patterns, mending the past, and discovering our true selves in God. I can't wait to get started as we learn together how to become the best version of who we are with God's help. Hey everyone, and welcome back to this week's episode of the Best of You podcast. This week, I'm taking a deep dive into a topic that I'm passionate about, and that's because so many of you listening, I know, get ensnared by toxic behaviors, just as I have struggled with getting ensnared by them. When you are someone who is kind-hearted, who wants to be helpful to others, who is highly empathetic, who is highly responsible, those wonderful strengths can also make us more susceptible to other people's toxic strategies. And so one of the things that I'm passionate about doing is naming those toxic strategies so that you can be equipped to be wise. Because unfortunately, we live in a world where some folks will try to use toxic strategies to manipulate you, to control you, to harm you. And if you don't know what those strategies are, it can be really hard to know how to protect yourself. So in last week's episode, episode 94, Emily P. Freeman talked about discerning yellow and red flags. And so today I want to dive in a little bit more deeply into what are some of those yellow and red flag behaviors to be on the lookout for? Because it's really hard to protect yourself and be wise if you don't know what these toxic strategies are. Are. So before we get started, I want to remind you that next week on Tuesday, March 26th, I am hosting an hour-long masterclass, How to Stop Feeling Stuck in Your Head. It's at 5 p.m. Eastern. If you want to attend live with me, you'll have a chance to ask questions, but you will also get the recording so you can watch it at any time. This is bonus content for my new book, I Shouldn't Feel This Way. I took a poll online, and this is the topic you most wanted to get started on early. So I'm giving you bonus content on how to stop feeling stuck in your head or tripped up by your own mental gymnastics. To get access to that class, simply pre-order one copy of I Shouldn't Feel This Way. Anywhere books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, you can call your local independent bookstore and 
pre-order I Shouldn't Feel This Way through them. That's a fantastic way to support local bookstores. When you pre-order one copy of I Shouldn't Feel This Way, go over to my website, I Shouldn't Feel This Way.com. Enter your email address, where you bought the book, and you will automatically get emailed the first three chapters of the book, a few other freebies, including a guided journal, as well as information on how to access this masterclass. So pre-order a copy of I Shouldn't Feel This Way. Go to I Shouldn't Feel This Way.com. Just put in your email address and you'll get all the information you need emailed directly to you. So today, I want to dive in to four toxic behaviors I think everyone should know about and how to protect yourself. So first of all, what are toxic behaviors? What do I mean by that? The word toxic simply means dangerous, destructive, or harmful, right? It's any sort of behavior that is designed to hurt you. Some behaviors are annoying. We don't like them, but they're not actually harming us. When we're talking about toxic behaviors, we're talking about behaviors that are damaging. They're doing harm on some level. The key point to remember about toxic behaviors is they're a consistent pattern of behaviors over time. Any one of us can be toxic in a moment. Any one of us can lie, can guilt trip, can maybe even manipulate, can lash out angrily, can triangulate. Any of these things we're going to talk about today, every single one of us has probably done at some point in our lives. If we're honest with ourselves, we struggle with certain toxic behaviors more than others. We can all be toxic in a moment, but here's the difference between a mistake and a pattern of toxic behaviors over time. Number one, frequency. Making a mistake is part of being human. It's often an isolated incident. It occurs infrequently. A pattern of toxic behaviors occurs repeatedly over time. These harmful behaviors continue to recur despite the consequences of those actions, despite the feelings of others. There's a clear pattern of these behaviors over time. It's not just a one-off mistake. Number two, intent. Mistakes that we make are usually unintentional They might result from a lack of knowledge. They might result from a lack of understanding in the moment. They might result from our own stress. We get overwhelmed. Maybe we melt down. We do something we wish we didn't done. We get stuck in a moment. We grasp for a strategy to get ourselves out of the moment. We do something that later on we go, oh, I could have handled that situation better. That's a mistake, right? A pattern of toxic behaviors tends to be more intentional. And even if a toxic behavior was not initially intended to harm, If someone refuses to modify that behavior after its effects are made known, that might reflect a harmful intent. This gets a little bit into the buzzword narcissism. You can go back to episode one. When someone is narcissistic, they are not capable of caring how their behaviors impact you. And so maybe they're just completely sold over to self-preservation narcissistically, but it's still harmful intent because that person is not willing to change or to grow or to heal. And that leads us right into the third differentiating factor between someone who makes a mistake and a toxic pattern of behaviors over time, and that's willingness to change. After making a mistake, someone who feels remorse takes responsibility and shows a genuine willingness to learn from the experience so that they can avoid repeating it. That's what you do when you make a mistake. Now, listen, we're not perfect. A really bad habit that someone has developed over years can take a long time to change. And so we're not asking for perfection, but we are asking for ownership and responsibility, and we are asking for steps toward improvement. With toxic behaviors, there's typically a lack of genuine remorse or taking responsibility. Instead of that, there's denial, there's justification, there's rationalization. Well, if you wouldn't do this, I wouldn't have to resort to this toxic behavior. There's blame shifting. I'm going to blame you for my toxic behaviors. Or there might just be repeated empty promises to change without any real action. And we see this, right? Oh, I'm so sorry. It'll never happen again. And then it's Groundhog Day. And that person keeps doing it. They're not actually taking responsibility for those toxic actions. Now, listen, toxic patterns of behaviors lie on a spectrum. Some folks demonstrate mostly toxic behaviors. There's very little good 
And in those cases, you have to ask yourself, why am I continuing to be in relationship with this person when the impact of their presence on my life is mostly harmful? That's one end of the spectrum. There are also a lot of people that are more in the middle of that spectrum. And what that means is they have maybe a really toxic habit that is repeated, that they don't change, that they're not showing signs to growth, but there's also some good. And those are some of the most challenging relationships. You might want to continue on in a relationship with that person because there's some good there. There are good reasons. There are positive benefits to the relationship. And in those instances, you have to figure out how to quarantine and protect yourself from the toxic behavior while still enjoying the person's good qualities. So if you want more on that, on the nuances of those boundaries, check out my book, The Best of You. It's a lot about the nuances of healthy boundary setting in relationships. And so when you think about that spectrum, for example, maybe there's a person in your life, a friend or a parent or a family member who tends to manipulate you to get their emotional needs met. They don't want to hurt you, and there are good things there. Maybe they're really loyal. Maybe they do show up for you when you need them. Maybe they help out with your kids. But the pattern of manipulation in this one area really does hurt you, right? So that's an example of where there's some good, but there's also some harm. And you need to be able to name that harmful behavior in order to protect yourself from it so that you can enjoy this person's good qualities. When you download your first three chapters of I Shouldn't Feel This Way, you're going to see how important it is to name things. Naming things frees us, not so that you can label another person, but so that you can name behaviors. You'll start to see these behaviors. You'll start to see them in yourself. You'll start to see them in your family members. You'll start to see them in your friends. It doesn't mean all of those people demonstrating these behaviors are toxic people that you have to cut out of your life. That is not what this means. There's two important byproducts of learning to name toxic behaviors. Number one, you will learn how to protect yourself. Okay, this person tends to do this. I'm not in this to go call them out on their stuff. What I am in this is to become a healthier version of myself. So the more I can see that behavior and name it, I can begin to extract myself from that toxicity so that I can stay healthy, so that I can grow, so that I can keep moving forward on the path God wants me to be on. And now that I know what this is and that it's in fact toxic, I can start to untangle from it and keep moving forward toward growth. That's number one. But number two, as you disentangle from toxic behaviors, you will begin to have healthier boundaries. And guess what that does? That empowers the other person to make their own choice. And you'll find out really quickly if that other person begins to change with you and grow as well. That's amazing. You've just been part of a healing process. You've unleashed more healing through healing yourself and extracting yourself from toxicity. You've unleashed more healing. That other person is now going to get freer too. On the other hand, that other person may recognize that you're setting different boundaries. They may recognize that you're shifting the dynamics in a relationship and they might not like it and they might get more toxic. They might continue with their toxic behaviors. They might even ratchet up the intensity of the toxicity. That's also their choice. And as they do that, you will need to continue to protect yourself and move toward health. So this process of learning to name and identify toxic behaviors is about getting healthier yourself, removing the toxins as best you can from your relationships. It's also about empowering other people to make healthy choices, not because you're trying to get them to change, but because by you getting healthier and extracting yourself, it will just automatically unleash a ripple effect of healing that other person will have their own choice to make. You're not in control of the choice they make, but you are at least giving them that opportunity. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. What's the first thing you'd do if you had an extra hour in your day? Would you go for a run, take a nap, read a book, maybe just spend some time hanging out with a friend? A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. The question is, time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? Well, therapy can help you find out what matters to you so you can do more of it. We can't get more time in our day, but we can be intentional about figuring out what matters most. Therapy can help you figure out how to prioritize the people that mean the most of you, the activities that actually make you come alive, and the purposeful things you want to achieve. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. 
Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash best of you today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash best of you. So many people I talk to tell me constantly how hard it is to navigate the world of dating. If you're single or someone you love is single and trying to figure it all out, it can be really overwhelming. And the purpose of the Heart of Dating podcast is to unmask this ever complicated world of dating, especially in the Christian world. So there are a lot of different resources, but there aren't many centralized area where Christians can access dating advice, help, and practical guidance easily and in an accessible fashion. The ultimate hope is that the Heart of Dating podcast will start a healthy conversation for men and women and provide wise input and direction as your hosts, Kate and JJ Tomlin, answer some tough questions and uncover some transformative ways to develop a healthy attitude and approach to dating as a Christian. Check out the Heart of Dating podcast anywhere you get your podcast, and you can watch all the episodes on YouTube. Here are the four toxic behaviors I want to talk about today. Number one is manipulation. Number two is gaslighting. It's a buzzword, but it's an important one to understand in our culture today. Number three is constant criticism. And number four is triangulation. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. There are a lot of toxic behaviors, but these are four that I see frequently in the people that I work with in my own life and the people that I serve. All of these behaviors have one thing in common. These are all forms of manipulation and control. We manipulate other people to avoid doing our own work. We try to control others instead of taking control of ourselves. That's the root of all toxic behaviors. I don't like what's happening inside of me. I don't like what I feel. I don't like how I feel about myself. I don't like how I feel in this situation. Instead of taking ownership of myself with God's help, I try to manipulate you. I try to control you. I try to get other people to do the work that is mine to do. That is the root of toxic behaviors. And so when you begin to recognize these toxic behaviors, you stop letting other people manipulate and control you. It was never your job to do this work for them. It's their job to do their own work. When you recognize these strategies and stop being hooked by them, you free yourself to be a healthier person and you remove that avenue that this other person has been using inappropriately, which gives them that choice. They get to choose then what they're going to do with that. And their choice is not your responsibility. So let's talk about manipulation. Manipulation is a form of control. It's a more insidious, often indirect form of control. When we say someone's controlling in an overt way, these tend to be domineering people that just get really aggressive and create power moves, telling you what to do, what to think, or what to feel. And that's a form of toxicity. Manipulation is a more indirect or covert form of control. Now, this is really important. So listen closely. Someone who's manipulative is trying to influence or control your actions, your emotions, your decisions to serve their interests. And their interests are selfish, right? They're not trying to help you. The effort to manipulate is at the expense of your well-being, and it's certainly without your consent. So often this is done really subtly, where you might not even realize you're being manipulated, and it is not for your good. It is for the person who's doing the manipulating to feel powerful, to feel better about themselves. Again, as I said before, they're not doing their own work. And so they're trying to manipulate you to behave or think or feel or act in a certain way that makes them feel better about themselves. Here are some examples. Someone who guilt trips you tries to get you to feel bad even when you haven't done anything wrong. Someone who's guilt tripping you doesn't respect your personal boundaries. Maybe you tell your friend, I can't make it this week, and I'm so sorry. I wish I could be there. I can't. I've got these five things going on in my own family. And instead of honoring that, right, and saying, oh, I'm disappointed. I wish you could make it, but I completely understand, right? That's a healthy response. I'm disappointed. I'm taking responsibility for my own emotions, and I also completely understand and I honor 
that decision that you made. That decision makes sense to me. I get it. Someone who guilt trips or manipulates you might say something like, I've done everything for you. I dropped everything to be there for you. And you can't do this one thing for me. And so they're manipulating you. They're making you feel bad. You've actually made a wise decision but they're trying to make you feel bad because they can't tolerate the disappointment or for whatever reason, they can't tolerate the fact that you've said a healthy no. Now, remember, we can all do this in a moment. This becomes toxic when it's a regular pattern over time, when someone is constantly disrespecting your boundaries and guilting you to make you feel bad for healthy decisions you are in fact making. Another example of manipulation can be passive aggressive digs right? Well, I guess you're just too busy for me. That's a manipulative statement. You're trying to get the other person to feel bad. In contrast, taking responsibility for your own emotions would be to say, oh man, I'm bummed. I'd love to see you more. I love having you around, but I understand, right? You're honoring that the other person has made choices. Now, listen, this is nuanced because we are allowed to set healthy boundaries for ourselves in response to someone else's boundaries. If you're in a relationship with someone who you feel like is too busy for you, they're just never available. They never call you back. They're never showing up for things. And that hurts you. You get to protect yourself. It's not okay to try to manipulate the other person to get them to show up for you. That's not okay. But what you can do in that situation is just move on to another friendship. Or you can even communicate that and say, man, I would love to have more time with you. I think you're amazing. I wish we had more time together. I see that you've got a lot on your plate and I really want to honor that. And so in order to honor you, I've got to step back and I need to invest more in these other relationships. That would be a healthy response to someone who you've realized, oh, they're too busy for me. They don't have time for me. You would be proactive to shift away from investing in that person, not to punish them, not to threaten them, but simply to align your decisions with the reality. That would be a healthy response. But to try to continually manipulate that other person to do something they clearly aren't doing or don't want to do or haven't decided to do or can't make time to do is toxic. You can't manipulate or control somebody to being in a relationship with you. It's not fair to yourself or to the other person. And so again, we'd sometimes do these things because we don't know better, right? We're like, oh man, I'm hurt by this other person. I don't know what to do. And so we resort to some of these toxic behaviors. All of us do at times. But when you become aware, you are then responsible to change. And so if someone is guilt tripping you, they're trying to manipulate or control you to get more of your time, to get more of your money, to get more of your volunteer work, to get more of your caretaking. In whatever way, you need to recognize when someone is manipulating you versus when there's a legitimate need. And if someone's manipulating you, it can be really hard because you feel bad. They're masters at making you feel guilty. And so for you, you have to recognize, I think I'm being manipulated here. This person never respects my boundaries. They never respect my healthy no. They always want more for me than I can give. They're always trying to get me to do things I'm not comfortable doing. There's a consistent pattern of that. And I hate how I feel. That's a red flag when you're repeatedly operating out of guilt. I call it guilt-driven love. That's a red flag. And your job is not to get the other person to change. Your job is to recognize that and figure out before God, what is my actual responsibility to this person? What is the actual need, if there is any? And what is my actual responsibility to this person, if there is any? And so often your actual responsibility to this person is very different than what they're trying to manipulate out of you. And so your job is to recognize I'm being manipulated here. I've got to stop responding to every single one of these digs, every single one of these manipulative statements aimed at making me feel guilty. I've got to pause and inside myself name it. Ooh, I think I'm being guilt tripped here. God, use that comma, God. God, I think I'm being guilt tripped here. The first thing I've got to do is try not to respond to that guilt trip. Separate out from it. Get really logical about it. What is the actual need? What am I actually responsible for? Find some safe people to bounce that off of. Ask a couple of safe people, hey, do you think this is actually my responsibility? Does this seem like a fair ask to you? Gain some objectivity and then set those healthy boundaries going forward. Next is gaslighting. 
Gaslighting is a really toxic form of manipulation. It ratchets up the toxicity. It's a form of psychological abuse. It's when someone uses lies and deception to manipulate you into questioning yourself or feeling crazy. They're messing with you. They're trying to manipulate you into doubting yourself, doubting your memory or doubting your perceptions of reality, your own instincts, doubting what you believe to be true. And they're doing this to try to get you to stay dependent on them, to exert power over you so that you won't leave them, so that you won't maybe out them. Maybe they're doing something wrong and they're trying to keep you feeling crazy so that you won't unleash the power of truth because they're terrified of that. They don't want their own stuff to come to the surface. So they try to manipulate you so that you won't actually get to the truth of what's happening. Here's an example, a classic example of gaslighting. Maybe your spouse has started drinking again and you confront them on it. You say, hey, you know, it seems like you might be drinking again. You know, I've just noticed you seem more bleary eyed. You're staying out late. I'm just curious what's going on. First of all, they deny it. They lie. No, I'm not. Then they accuse you. You're crazy. You're paranoid. How dare you accuse me? Right? So there's two components. They're lying to cover up their own tracks, and then they're turning it on you to make you feel bad. Maybe you have a parent or a family member or a friend who's talking behind your back or slandering you or doing some really harmful things behind your back, and you confront them on it. You go to them and say, hey, what's going on? You know, are you doing this? Are you talking about me? Did you spread this gossip about me? And they deny it. I would never do that. How dare you accuse me? You are ungrateful. Do you see what's happening there? They're making you feel crazy. You feel like a bad person because you confronted them. It's so toxic because you feel bad. And in fact, you were right. You question yourself. You doubt yourself. It leads to so much chaos and confusion in your own soul. Number three, constant criticism. We all need to be able to receive constructive feedback. That's a part of growth. That's a part of becoming a truer version of ourselves. My husband and I use the metaphor of lettuce in the teeth. You know, we need people who get our backs and say, hey, I hate to tell you this, but you got lettuce in your teeth. And that could be like, I hate to tell you this, but the way you talk to that person, oh, that wasn't good. You might need to go back and apologize. We need people in our lives who help us see our blind spots, who point out when we're showing up with lettuce in our teeth. Even though we don't like to hear it, we need those people. That is healthy. That kind of constructive feedback that's rooted in trust, that's rooted in safety, that's rooted in relationships where there's mutual consent. You've agreed with a friend or with a loved one or with a family member, hey, would you let me know? If I'm out of bounds, I need your set of eyeballs on this because I'm not sure, right? I'm trying to figure this out. And so I need you to let me know if I'm out of bounds here, if the way I'm talking to our kids or if the way I'm showing up at this small group or if the way I'm showing up with these other friends of ours, you know, if there's anything I'm doing that you think is out of line, right? We need those types of people in our life. Constant criticism is completely different. It can actually be a form of verbal abuse. It's when someone is continually, again, that word continually, consistently over time, undermining you, pointing out perceived flaws, criticizing your actions, your appearance, your abilities. It's toxic. When you're the target of constant criticism, it's as if you're receiving a million tiny paper cuts to your soul constantly. It can show up with shaming comments. It can show up with sarcasm. It can show up with insults. It can show up with broad, sweeping statements of judgment. For example, you're always so disorganized. Can't you do anything right? Are you really going to wear that? Do you really want your hair to look that way? It can also come out as sarcasm. Well, not everybody can be as perfect as you are. That's a dig. These comments leave you feeling wounded. Now, again, we need constructive feedback. Sometimes a partner or parent or a loved one or you as a parent might need to say, oh, I don't know if that's the shirt you want to wear, right? There's a way to give constructive feedback. It's hard. You got to think about how to give the people that you love constructive feedback in their lives. Criticism, sarcasm, passive aggressive comments, constantly pointing out someone else's flaws is toxic. And here's the thing. Someone who's constantly criticizing is not doing it for your good. They're not actually doing it to help you. 
They're doing it to make themselves feel better. That's that intent piece. They're not trying to help you improve or grow or change. They're trying to make themselves feel better than you. It's born out of deep-seated insecurity and a fragility of self. It's not about trying to help you improve. It's about trying to make themselves feel better. And it's really toxic. You are not created to thrive in a toxic environment that is cruel, shaming, or harsh. Even if a part of you knows rationally, I know this is about them. I know this isn't about me, right? I know they're insecure. It doesn't matter. It still wounds you. None of us is created to thrive in those settings. God designed our souls, hearts, and minds for warmth, for care, for connection, for compassion. I think of the scripture where it says God's kindness is what leads us to repentance, right? So even when God points out that lettuce in our teeth, even when God comes to us and says, oh, Allison, I don't think you should have done that. I think you were deceptive there because you were scared to be brave. I think you were a little bit hard on that person, a little judgmental of that person. Do you hear the tone in my voice? When God shows me those things, God isn't shaming me. It hurts. I don't like it when God points out when I made a mistake. I don't like it when the people I love point out, ooh, Allison, I don't think you showed up exactly as your best self in that situation. It hurts, but it doesn't shame me, right? That kindness leads to me going, oh man, you're right. I did. I could have done better. I need to make it right. The truth sets us free. It liberates us. It helps us become a better person. It doesn't shame us. It doesn't crush us. Constant criticism makes us feel desolate and helpless and like we'll never be good enough. It doesn't help us. It harms us. It's really toxic. Our dogs love Sundays. I'm not kidding. One of our dogs was the slowest eater on earth for the first several years of her life. It was painful how long it would take her to eat. The minute we introduced her to Sundays, she just laps it up. She loves it. Sundays is healthy dog food that's easy to store and serve. Most foods are one or the other, but Sundays is both. It's fresh dog food made from a short list of human-grade ingredients that contains 90% meat, 10% superfoods, and 0% synthetic nutrients. But unlike other fresh dog food, it doesn't require refrigeration or preparation. It's air-dried, so you simply pour and serve. It's so easy. Get 40% off your first order of Sundays. Go to sundaysfordogs.com slash best of you or use code best of you at checkout. I am always looking for ways to save time and money while also maximizing health benefits. And that's why I am thrilled to have discovered Thrive Market. Thrive Market is my go-to for all my grocery and household essentials and the convenience of getting everything online and quickly shipped to my doorstep is just un. Beatable. I love that Thrive Market carries brands with the highest quality ingredients and sourcing methods. They restrict hundreds of ingredients across their food and cleaning categories, and I can easily use their on-site filters to get really specific about what matters to me. For example, I can filter out low sugar, non-dairy, gluten-free, any of those very specific dietary needs that anyone in your family might have. And as a Thrive Market member, I save money on every single grocery order. On average, I save about 30% each each time. And best of all, when you join Thrive Market, you are also helping a family in need with their one-for-one membership matching program. You join and they give a membership away. Join in on the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash best of you for 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash best of you. Thrivemarket.com slash best of you. Lastly, I want to talk about triangulation. I see this all the time. I think it's one of the toxic patterns of behavior that is talked about the least and very quietly does a lot of damage, especially in families and in close friend groups. Triangulation is when one person pulls you into the middle of their conflict with a third person. Instead of working through their problem directly with the person involved, they might do any of the following. They might vent to you about the other person, but never address their own frustrations with the other person. 
they might ask you directly to enter in to fix their problem with the other person when it's not your place to enter in. So for example, maybe your mom comes to you and vents to you about how your dad has been treating her. And the implication is you should go talk to your dad and get him to apologize to me. You should go talk to your dad and get him to give me more money. You should go talk to your dad and get him to change his behaviors. It is toxic, especially when parents do it to a child. But even in a friend group, maybe a friend comes to you and says, I don't like how our other friend treats me. I think you should talk to her and get her to see the error of her ways. It's really toxic. It's a form of manipulation. That person's trying to get you to do her work for her. And sometimes they do it indirectly, right? They just kind of tell you all the stuff that bothers them about this other person and you're left holding the baggage. You're left holding a suitcase full of burdens that aren't your burdens. Maybe you don't have a problem with the other person, but now you've got the suitcase, you've got the baggage and you don't know what to do with it. It leaves you feeling really anxious. It leaves you feeling really guilty because you feel bad that you're not fixing this problem for the other person but you also feel bad because you don't want to go to this other person that you don't have a problem with and give them the suitcase of baggage. You don't want to do that, but you don't know what to do. You're left by yourself with a suitcase full of baggage that was never yours to carry. You absorb all the weight of the conflict without any clear path to resolve it. And when this occurs consistently over time, maybe within a family, maybe within a close friend group, you're also not getting the attention you need. You're being viewed as a mediator or as a dumping ground for other people's problems instead of as your own distinct person who is worthy of a two-way reciprocal relationship. And I see this all the time with folks who are highly empathetic, who are caretakers, who are helpers, who are trying to help other people. They get put into the middle of other people's problems. Now, there are healthy ways to seek third-party counsel. Sometimes we need to bounce off of another friend a problem that we're having. We need advice. We need wisdom in healthy ways. I actually tend to think of the story of Mary and Martha in the Bible as an example of triangulation. The story is found in Luke 10, 38 through 42. And in the passage, Martha is busy with extensive preparations. She's trying to get everything on the table. She's trying to make sure the event gets pulled off while her sister Mary is sitting quietly at Jesus' feet, just listening to him. And so a lot of us can identify with Martha. That's annoying, right? Listen, I'm doing all the work. Come on, help me out. There are a lot of ways to interpret this passage. But one of the ways that I like to think about it is in terms of triangulation. We don't know what Martha's intent was. We don't know if she did this regularly, right? We don't know her backstory. This might've been a one-off, but instead of going to Mary with her gripe, she goes to Jesus and complains about Mary. Don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her she should be helping me, right? She goes to Jesus with her gripe about Mary. And if you notice, Jesus sets a boundary. He's like, listen, Mary's made a choice and I'm good with her choice. You've made a different choice. What's to say that your choice is better? Jesus does not indulge her attempt to pull him into the middle, right? He doesn't say, oh, you're right. You know, Mary, you really should help Martha here. He sets that healthy boundary in that situation. We see Jesus setting healthy boundaries with toxic behaviors all throughout the New Testament. He was a master at setting boundaries with toxicity. And so what do we have to learn from Jesus about protecting ourselves from these toxic behaviors? Well, number one is start with yourself. Start noticing any of these patterns in yourself without shame, because the number one best way to protect yourself from toxicity at the hands of others is to become really aware of it in yourself. Oh man, sometimes I do that. Sometimes I triangulate because I don't know how to go to the person directly. Lord, help me change that. Here's the thing. When you begin to name and notice your own unhealthy strategies, you become really aware of them and you gain a lot more confidence in seeing them in the world around you. Because when we're indulging in our own toxic behaviors, we don't want to call other people out because we don't want to call ourselves out. So number one is just to notice without shame, oh, these are some things I do. I presented at a workshop last weekend, and at the end of the day, I asked them what they got out of it. And one woman raised her hand and she said, you know what I got out of this workshop? She said, I'm not very good 
at receiving other people's boundaries. And I almost teared up. I was like, man, that is profound. The fact that what you got out of this was, I'm the one that's not so good at honoring other people's boundaries. That awareness is so key, not only to becoming a healthier person yourself, but also to recognizing toxic behaviors in other people. The best antidote against toxicity in others is to be really, really honest with ourselves before God. Number two, if you're dealing with someone who is regularly indulging in these toxic behaviors and without showing any remorse and without really responding to you, be aware that it is going to stir up a lot of guilt and a lot of painful emotions inside of you when you start to change. And you need to anticipate that because when you start to set boundaries with toxic behaviors, it can feel really uncomfortable and folks will try to use that against you. They know they can make you feel guilty. They'll know they can exploit your good heart, your high responsibility. And so just be aware that guilt doesn't mean you've done something wrong. It might mean you've done something incredibly brave. And so you've got to really work on that core strength, telling yourself, I'm trying to get healthier. This other person might not like it, but I know that disentangling from their toxicity and moving toward health is ultimately better for both of us, even if that other person doesn't see it that way, right? Even if that other person doesn't see it that way. You're taking God's invitation to get healthier is good and is healthier for that other person, even when they don't see it that way. And then lastly, I want you to think about the difference between word boundaries and action boundaries. Boundaries do not require anything from the other person. You're not trying to get the other person to change their ways. You have no control over that. You cannot change another person. Most of us want to get the other person to understand what they're doing. We want them to recognize, oh my gosh, I'm engaging in a toxic behavior. I need to stop. That happens sometimes, but it often doesn't. It often doesn't. Your goal is is not to get the other person to understand the error of their ways. Your goal is to remove yourself from the toxic behavior. You're not trying to get the other person to change their ways. You have no control over that. You cannot change another person. Your goal when dealing with toxic behaviors is to take effective action to remove yourself from the toxicity as much as possible. So many people get fixated on wanting to get the other person to change or at the very least to understand what they've done wrong. It's really hard for us to believe that that other person doesn't care, right? They're so absorbed in this toxic patterns of behaviors, they can't see how their behaviors are harming you. And that hurts us. And we do need to grieve that, right? There's a grief involved in setting healthier boundaries. We have to grieve what we can't get from the other person. And it's painful to watch someone choose to continue in their pattern of toxic behaviors. But the bottom line is that obedience to God and a commitment to your own health and wholeness means that you can only take charge of your own responses and actions. You cannot change another person. If you try to get that other person to change, you are in jeopardy of trying to control or manipulate them. You only have control over your own responses, your own reactions, and the steps you take to move away from toxic behaviors. You might communicate with a word boundary, but if you choose that route, your goal is to state the action you are going to take in response to the toxic behavior. It's something that you should be able to do without their help, without their permission, right? Even if they don't like it, you're going to let them know what you are going to do to change the dynamic going forward. So for example, you always start with the good, start with something positive, especially if you're planning to stay in the relationship or it's the first time you've communicated. I appreciate you. I value our relationship. I've noticed that our conversations often veer into discussing your issues with dad or with mom or with my sister or with this other friend of ours. This triangulation is uncomfortable for me. It stirs up anxiety inside of me, and I'm not going to participate 
in it anymore. In the future, if you bring up your issues with this person, I'm going to excuse myself from the conversation. I'm going to get off the phone or I'm going to walk away. This is a boundary that I need to set for my own health. Full stop. That's it. And do you see how you're naming a behavior? You're naming it, right? But you're saying, this is what I'm going to do to not participate in this anymore. That's it. And then you have to make good on that with your actions. You don't have the conversation with that person anymore. If it happens again, you use an action boundary. You remove yourself. Now, again, depending on the nature of the relationship, depending on the level of toxicity, the other person might ratchet up the toxicity. They don't like it. If that's the case, you need to be wise. You might take someone with you. Use the buddy system to go into that conversation. Don't do it alone because you need someone there to help anchor you. You might have to do it over the phone. You might have to do it over text. You might have to do it in writing. That's okay. Depending on the level of toxicity, sometimes that's what you have to do to let the boundary be known. The goal is to get yourself out of interacting with that toxic behavior. But again, notice you've taken responsibility for the actions. You're going to remove yourself. The other person doesn't have to do anything. Now, I want to give a note with gaslighting, with someone who uses gaslighting tactics, words almost never work because people who gaslight are a master of manipulating words. No matter what you say to them, they're going to say, well, you're paranoid. You're cruel. I can't believe you're going to do that. That's evil, right? They're going to turn anything, no matter how healthy, no matter how well-worded the script is, they're going to turn it and use it against you. That's what gaslighters do. So in this case, in the case where there's a lot of toxicity there, words won't work, you're going to use action boundaries. Action boundaries are a very legitimate option in the case of toxic behaviors, especially when you're pretty sure this person isn't going to take it very well. They're not going to like it. Action boundaries are really powerful. An action boundary just means that you let your actions do the talking. They're communicated through changes in your behaviors. Instead of using words to communicate, you simply refuse to engage. And there are a lot of ways to do this. You might excuse yourself from a call. You might leave the room. You might use grounding exercises. You might stop being alone with the other person because it's just not safe. You have to only be with them in group gatherings or group situations. You use the buddy system to have someone with you when you have to be with that person, depending on the level of severity. You let your actions do the work of creating that boundary. And in some cases, you have to leave the relationship altogether because like we said, there's no good that counterbalances the harm and you have to leave that relationship altogether. Now, listen, this is all a lot harder than it sounds right? Depending on the level of toxicity, you might want to reach out to a professional therapist to help you. There's a lot on this in my book, The Best of You. So look at those resources, get support for yourself. But the most important thing I want you to understand as we close today, naming a pattern of toxic behaviors is an act of love. It's a gift you give not only to yourself, but also to others. It's not loving to indulge or enable somebody else's toxic pattern of behaviors. It's not loving to them and it's not loving to yourself. Whether or not the other person recognizes that gift that you are giving them is beside the point. You are creating an opportunity for both parties, yourself and the other person, to brave a different, healthier path. You are freeing yourself to pursue the healing and goodness that lies ahead and you are releasing the other person to making their own choices. You can love someone and leave a toxic pattern of behaviors. You can forgive someone and maintain firm boundaries. You can value someone and refuse to engage in their toxicity. Jesus said, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. We long to embody the purity of doves soaring above life's challenges, but the problem is that while we are still inhabiting planet Earth, we are at times going to have to inch our way through the murky and chaotic underbelly of this life created by toxic behaviors. It's just part of reality, and pretending otherwise won't change it. I want you to be wise. I want you to be shrewd. And I also don't want you to lose your innocence. That's the goal here. As you name and recognize toxicity for what it is, you will find your way through it. You will move out of its snare and into the healing 
the honesty, the loving mutuality God wants for you. And you will appreciate the joy of what real love and genuine goodness looks like all the more for the pain you've endured. You are worth the work that it takes to move away from toxic behaviors. Your brave actions honors God. It honors yourself. And I promise you, whether it feels this way or not, it honors the other person. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode of The Best of You. It would mean so much if you take a moment to subscribe. You can go to Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you listen to podcasts and click the plus or follow button. That will ensure you don't miss an episode and it helps get the word out to others. While you're there, I'd love it if you leave your five-star review. I look forward to seeing you back here next Thursday. And remember, as you become the best of who you are, you honor God, you heal others, and you stay true to your God-given self.